if you want to earn money now, content creation probably isn't the best way to go about it. Freelancing is a great way you can start earning money now. But if you also enjoy doing it, you just want to build an audience and you want to build a community or you just want to build your presence on a platform and you want to earn money, then yeah, maybe it is like the right choice. The content market is so saturated that even if this is your passion project or a creative outlet, you do almost have to consider like, okay, how does my content stand out from someone else's? So almost start to see your failures as a part of the experiment. So in tech, we have this word that everyone just lives by and it's the word iterate. Like iterate, 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 fail forward, fail forward. That's what working in tech is all about. So to begin with, I like asking a question. Who are you? What do you do? And why should people listen to you? I am Angel Zhang. I do a lot of things, really. <laughs> I work in marketing and tech. I am a content creator on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, and I also run a small e-commerce business on the side as well. So I guess you can say marketing specialist, entrepreneur, to sum it up. I guess why people should listen to me, I have been working in these specific fields for quite a long time. So I've been in marketing for over eight years. I've been in the content space for over 10 years now, which is crazy to think about. I guess I have some interesting stuff to share, stories, tips. It's cool. I find it interesting how you mentioned you do like work and then you have a content creator and then you're an entrepreneur with your own brand. How do you manage everything at the same time? Do you actually mm. have free time? <laughs> Great question. So I get this question a lot about the whether I have free time or not. I think the biggest difference for me and what I often tell people is my sort of, oh, what is the word that Ollie uses? Your, it's like the skill that you have or like your, oh, your unfair advantage. I feel like my unfair advantage is actually that everything that I do for work is also something that I really, really enjoy doing. So like marketing, like working in marketing in tech has been amazing. I love the entire process, the learning aspect of it, being able to take products to build the go-to-market plan for products. All of that has been really enjoyable for me. And then I didn't start content creation as a business. I started it very much so as a fun side project, like passion project. So it was really a creative outlet for me. So that's never really felt like work up until very recently. And then again, like the the side e-commerce business, it was a passion project, right? It was like I needed a product that didn't really exist yet in the world. And so a couple of friends of mine and me decided to try to build something and try to like find a product that we can also share with other people who might be looking for that product. So I do spend a lot of my time doing these things like creating content and working on my business, but it doesn't feel like work. Like it feels like a fun thing. Like it feels like I'm learning, feels like I'm just being creative. And then, yeah, I guess the rest of my free time I use to see friends and like read. But I will say a lot of my time goes to work, but it just doesn't feel like work to me. <laughs> Makes sense. Fair enough. Your business, it's desk accessories, correct? Yeah. How did you come up with that idea? Like. Oh, what product did you mm -hmm. think? Oh, I need this. It doesn't exist. Let me sell it. Which one was it? Yeah, it was the wooden laptop stand. So we have a birchwood laptop stand. We sort of thought of this when, you know, COVID was this big kind of at the start of COVID, I guess, at the height of it, where everybody was working from home. I've actually been working from home since pretty much the start of my career. We've always been a remote company. So that aspect didn't feel like much of a change for me. But a lot of my friends were going through that period of getting used to working from home and wanting to like fix up their workspace and make it look aesthetic and make it feel like a welcoming space. And for me personally, I bought a lot of just like work from home stuff from Amazon and it was all metal or black and gray and it was just felt really cold. It didn't feel inviting. It didn't make my workspace feel aesthetic and beautiful. It didn't make my workspace feel like a place I wanted to be essentially. So we started looking into products that could do that and that could sort of help you tailor a space that you're sitting at all day feel like a space that you actually want to be in. So that's how we decided on sort of the overall theme of products that we wanted to create. And then from there, we just sort of 
like sourced and worked with manufacturers to create products that sort of all came together, all carried that same like warm, wooden, very natural feel, create the line that we have today. Are you all still working there or is it just you or just a couple? Did someone fall off or are you the same people that yeah. started? We're the same people that started. So there is three of us. So me and two business partners, we're all still doing it. It's very much so a part-time business for us, something that we do because we enjoy it yeah. and because we can learn from it. But yeah, all three of us are still here. Do you ship worldwide or just uh, US, Canada? We do worldwide. Nice. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And about the content creation, you started like 10 years ago. When was it the point mm -hmm. that you said, Okay, this can actually become a business it's not just created outlet yeah i guess well, i don't know if i can tell you the exact year but i guess youtube has been my longest platform and then i want to say in like 2014 2015 i started to post pictures on instagram for fun it was very much so just like outfit and spell what i was wearing in 2020 i started tiktok so i would say instagram was the first platform that i actually started to make money from so i started to get invitations from brands to be a part of brand deals and sponsorships and then youtube sort of followed that even though youtube has been a platform that i've been on for longer it's been the longest platform to grow as well and it didn't really take off until quite late in the game so At that point, I was still very much so focused on my career. This was very much a side thing. It was great that I could earn money from it, but I didn't really think anything of it. And it really wasn't until probably, I want to say like three or four years, oh no, maybe four or five years ago now, where I started realizing that the revenue from my social media platforms from YouTube started to like match my nine to five income, like yeah. my salary at a tech job, which was crazy. And then, so I incorporated the business, made sure I was good with taxes and all of that. And then from there, started to take it a little bit more seriously. So started to post a lot more consistently, started to actually put an effort into the content that I was creating and not just have it be a fun creative thing. It didn't really kick in for me until I started to earn that money that felt like it could replace my nine to five income. Cool. That's actually nice. I think a lot of people are actually thinking like, how do these people start and oh, they make so much money from so many subs and then they don't consider all the effort that has been going on before that. And totally. they just see like, yeah. oh, yeah, they think they are an overnight success. But for you, it's been mm -hmm. like a 10-year thing going in the progress, which was first a created outlook and then became a business. Totally. Exactly. And I think that for, I mean, it's not impossible for overnight successes to happen, especially in this day and age. I think there are a lot of content creators who, you know, go viral really, really quickly yeah. and gain that audience really quickly. But I think what I appreciate about having had the time to actually learn and like experiment and build that up slowly is I learned that you have to build a business behind it and you have to set yourself up for yeah. taxes and you have to incorporate in all of those things. And I feel like that must be so hard for people who do go viral after a very short amount of time because their learning process gets compressed into this very short amount of time. And then, you know, I feel like it would be harder for them to maintain that success. Hmm. Whereas I've been working slowly and a lot of us have been working slowly at this success. So it just feels like a step-by-step -step process. Like I'm learning as I go. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Like first <laughs> yeah. you're figuring out, oh, what do I want to talk about? And then you're figuring out, oh, I could maybe make some money from these, some products here and there, perhaps some brand yeah. deals. So you start figuring out who you are rather than just posting oh i went viral not what now and then you don't even know totally. how to manage it maybe mm -hmm. do you think that's yeah, something a lot that perhaps someone that goes viral immediately or an overnight success let's say can sustain a long-term business opposed to someone that has been growing it for 10 years i don't think it's impossible but i think it really comes down to that person and what they want out of their platform because typically when you go viral very quickly it's because you are very on trend with what's going on right now but then 
you'll have to continue building that content around those trends but it's like you never really get to define like who you are or who your audience is or what the problem it is that you're trying to solve so I think if you are somebody who's gained that success really quickly you could you know learn to develop that mindset of of shifting towards okay so I have this audience what is the problem that I can solve for them how can I continue to serve this audience instead of sort of keeping your mind on like chasing views or chasing engagement I think there's that difference that really makes the difference between a somebody who's building a business versus somebody who's just trying to build a big audience and not know what to do with it Mm. yeah so I don't think it's impossible I think you just have to really get to that point where you can shift your mindset and figure out okay what can I do with this now and what is your goal actually with this is your goal just going full-time with it or is it oh, I want to be the best in something or I want my my actual brand to grow? Yeah, at this point, I would love to build a business behind my audience. So you asking me what my goal is actually a really, it's a great time for that question because this is kind of what I've been humming and hawing about for the past like six months or so. And I recently read Simon Sinek's book, Just Cause or no. Yeah, I think it's called Just Cause. Anyways, it's asking you to define your just cause. But essentially what that means is just to define your mission statement and your vision statement. And I've just been going back and forth about it. But I think really my goal is to have everything that I do, like all of my platforms, all the content that I put out, be put out there to help people learn something. And I feel like I've been really blessed in being able to find all these different jobs that I love and being able to do the work that makes me feel really fulfilled while also making sure that I'm, you know, taking care of my mental health and taking care of my personal growth. So that's kind of the direction that I'm heading in. That's the goal that I have in mind is to really just shift all my content towards being able to help people balance their personal growth and their career success and help them figure out how to live a life that makes them feel really fulfilled. And then ideally, I could build a business around that, right? So something either that's workshops or courses or, you know, what the core product is, I haven't decided on yet. But yeah, that's the goal now is to really shift towards more of that business mindset, but not really straying away from helping people, which is, you know, what content is for. And how do you balance... Because you mentioned living a more fulfilled and balanced life with work and and what you do. How do you do it? Great question. I really try to make sure that I am using my calendar really effectively. Like I am somebody who lives and swears by my calendar. If it doesn't exist in my calendar, it just doesn't (laughs) exist in my life. So what's really worked for me is just making sure that I am actually scheduling in things that are not work, right? So like I schedule in my morning routine, I schedule in my coffee time, my lunch time, my reading time, my gym time, time with friends. So just making sure that I'm being really intentional about how I craft my schedule that is what's been able to help me keep that balance between work because I think naturally I am somebody who loves to work and because I love what I do it's so easy to spend all of my time working Mm. so it's about that intentionality for me making sure that I'm actually making time to take care of myself out of my day (laughs) do you take time to do absolutely nothing in your day like literally just laying bed and do nothing no phone no reading nothing totally not every single day more so I probably do that a couple times a week where I am really intentional about how I'm doing nothing yeah I think it's really easy to get caught up with wanting to be super productive with every moment of your day but I also have heard from a lot of people who are you know more successful than me or more creative than me say that nothing time is actually so important for creatives so yeah like even if it's just like I have a dog luckily so I'm forced to like take her for a walk every day and make sure that we're going outside and enjoying nature so sometimes we'll just use that time like we'll go to a park I'll sit in the park she's running around and it just gives me the time to like breathe and (laughs) not do anything so yeah probably like once or twice a week I try to make sure I have that time blocked in but I should probably do it more often to be honest that's cool I think 
and I feel also that my dog actually gets me more out there as well. I have one dog and he's always like, especially during COVID, he was really making me go into walks outside of the street and getting physical activity, yeah. even though I didn't want to. I've yeah, seen a few totally. of your videos and I see like, mm. I don't know, Day in the Life or a vlog here and there. Are you one of those mm. creators that is going with the camera and recording everything they do? Or are you more like, today I'm going to record a day in the life and this is how it's going to look like and I'm going to plan everything? Probably somewhere in the middle. So I try to make sure that I'm really intentional about what I'm trying to show in that video. So I know that today I'm going to do a day in the life of being a marketing director or marketing manager. So at least set that topic. I know I won't be going too much on a tangent and like talking about things that won't matter to the people who are clicking into that specific video. But I'm also not somebody who, especially when it comes to vlogs, plan out everything that I'm going to show, especially when it comes to a day in the life, because I personally don't know exactly what that day is going to look like always. Sometimes meetings come up, sometimes the tasks that I'm doing gets changed um, based on like the need of the company. So yeah, it's somewhere in the middle. I decide on the topic, but then I sort of just film the day as it goes. And do you plan those videos or... Do you say like, oh no, today I feel like recording and then you just record? I do plan them out. I do have a content calendar that I try to follow. So just making sure that I am covering all the different topics that I want to talk about in a month or the different types of videos that I want to show. But I have had instances where I started doing a day in the life and then it just ends up being the most boring day ever. <laughs> so in those moments, I just scrap the video and I'm like, I'll try again next week or tomorrow or something which does happen right with vlogs yeah. like it's not not every day is going to be fun and exciting <laughs> but somehow we always end up showing only the exciting days so why not showing also those boring days like hey my life is not as exciting as i make it look like so i used to do i would say like 80 percent of my videos were day in the life of a marketing manager and my community really loves those videos because I am showing you such a realistic day of like my work day. I'm filming as I go. I talk about the projects that I'm working on. I talk about how I'm doing things. But even though that content does bring value in a lot of ways, I was already getting comments of like, hey, all your days look the same. I'm like, well, yeah, because they do look the same. Like this is what my nine to five looks like, you know? So it's more so... I still definitely show the very mundane aspects of my day. It's more so if like I know that that video did not provide any value. That's when I scrap the video and try to make a new one. Mm. So I think it's one thing to show a really casual or mundane day in your life to show what a realistic day looks like versus a day where, you know, the projects didn't work out or like you know, I didn't really get to work on anything interesting or it was like the exact same project from a previous day in the life. So that repetitiveness is what I'm trying to avoid. Yeah. I'm not trying to avoid like the realistic aspect of it. It's more so just I want to make sure each video at least teaches somebody something new. Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I do feel like sometimes we only see the best of the best in those type of videos. And yeah. when you show yeah, your life, Basically, it's the same for everyone, not just a creator. But then somehow, mm -hmm. I remember seeing a, a podcast, I think with Jet Kal on YouTube, Jet Kaluach, or I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, like a, this New mm -hmm. York content-based New York lifestyle. And mm -hmm. he would plan the day that he would do something exciting, something exciting to do. If it was a day in the life, yeah. he would try to get around with other creators or go around in the city to our museum or something, just to mm -hmm. show something exciting yeah do you try to do those exciting things often just for the sake of doing them or good question i feel like it's not necessarily a bad thing though to do that because honestly if you're trying to you know create content like the content market is so saturated that even if this is your passion project or a creative outlet you do almost have to consider like okay how does my content stand out from someone else's so you know i think there is a lot of value to showing like the very realistic at home days and all of that but i think 
having those opportunities of including those more fun activities that you plan either just for content or maybe you already have planned and then you film can be really great as well like I think it's a balance I personally wouldn't go and like craft an entire day just for content that's just not something that I ever have done but I will if I know that I'm filming content the day I will typically try to schedule in like oh maybe I'll go out to a cafe to get some work done so I'll try to schedule in things that still work within the day that I'm having like naturally and realistically but that maybe brings some sort of an interesting twist to the video yeah if that makes sense yeah definitely Mm -hmm. it's like the same thing as your dog forcing you to go outside right like sometimes I need those days where I'm like okay I'm gonna go out and and film at a cafe or like go for a walk or like do something today for the content because otherwise I wouldn't leave my house yeah (laughs) so it's kind of like mutually beneficial (laughs) yeah it's funny that you mentioned now the going to a cafe because I was gonna ask how do you do that Mm -hmm. of recording outside like don't you find it find yourself cringing a lot of times do you have that like totally going with your big camera and just recording yourself it's like feeling judged how do you go against that yeah I don't have a solution because I still feel that often I think for me the biggest thing maybe after having done it for so many years is I'm thinking less about being judged and rather about not wanting to bother anyone else Mm. so it's like I don't want people to feel uncomfortable because there's a camera around I mean, I still definitely have moments where I I cringe at myself because I'm walking around like holding a camera, talking to it. Right. But what I try to remind myself, especially now, is that, hey, like this is your job. This is what you do. Yeah. (laughs) Like this is paying for your living now. So, you know, why feel embarrassed about it? Right. But yeah, it's that other aspect of like making sure that my camera doesn't get in the way of other people and that people don't feel like, oh, like why, why am I being filmed? That really still bothers me. So I always try to like go to a cafe like when I know it's not going to be busy or if I find that the cafe is really busy, I'll go to a different one just so I still have that opportunity to film. I feel less embarrassed, but I'm also not bothering anyone else yeah. in the public. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. You're in Vancouver, right? Or I'm in Vancouver, yeah. Is there a big creator scene there? Because I think they do use Vancouver to recreate New York. So there's a lot of like Hollywood. But I've seen also videos of like creators, but there's not that many, I think, I feel like. There are a lot of creators, like just social media creators now. I see more and more. There's like probably tons that I don't even know of. I do know of this one group of creators, or I guess just just like friends, creator friends who are in the YouTube space. And there's quite a few of them. I mean, at least, I want to say like at least six or seven or eight of them just in that, that group, that small group. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like, I think there is comparatively to other cities a smaller population of creators in vancouver but it's also because vancouver is a pretty small city right like yeah toronto much bigger city all the state cities much bigger cities so i think the industry is still very much so growing in vancouver but it's definitely exponentially more than what it what even is like five ten years ago Mm. and how do you deal with that like because the solo the creator it's just a solo job you do mainly everything Mm. you choose what you record it's your face your branding so how do you deal that with like not just getting burned out or feeling bored like oh it's just me doing everything do you try to connect with other creators around you or yeah I definitely try to create connect with creators in the city so I have a few creator friends that I always go to and either meet them up for coffee and just have like co-working sessions or we'll just go out and like have dinner on Instagram and on TikTok. I'm in the fashion and beauty space as well. So there's often a lot of PR events that go on. Mm. So I try my best to attend those every once in a while to make sure that I'm still just like connecting with people and having that opportunity. Lately, I have been trying to connect with creators outside of Vancouver as well. So I did join PTYA, which is a program that Ali Abdal has, partially because it is nice having advice from people who are doing better than me or or from other professionals, but also partially because I am trying to just connect with people and meet people that aren't from the city. And then beyond that, I just try to, like, I'll DM people sometimes if I'm going to their city. So 
you were saying that you joined PTYA and that then you're DMing people. Yeah, so joining like masterminds and educational programs like PTYA to meet people. And then, yeah, I reach out to people through DMs or just through like emails sometimes even at this point. People that I know that are in a similar place than me or maybe even like a little bit ahead of me just to get their advice yeah. and, and start a conversation because you're right it's such a lonely job like I think that's like the biggest downfall about being a creator is how often you're just doing it alone and how do you actually go of approach that of DMing just a random creator like hey I'm Angel I'm a creator I have this amount of followers or subscribers and then you just text them or because a lot of times I feel like people that are just starting try to reach out to creators that perhaps are I would say 10 times or it's more like 100 times ahead of them so I can imagine that creators not just like you but even bigger than you also get a lot of DMs and messages totally so how do you approach someone yeah I think that you need to approach this as any other professional network like how you would approach any other sort of professional networking so don't just cold email people <laughs> or like cold dm people because typically if they are a creator they're probably getting so many dms from brands from you know their audience from other people trying to connect so really try to take the time to like make that cold call into a warm call so i always try to make sure i'm reaching out to creators that i'm already engaging with their content right like it's a creator that i genuinely comment on their their content because i love it it's creators that i am often like liking their content or maybe creators who have liked my content those are typically the people that i will outreach i very rarely will just pick a creator that I have had no other experience with and like cold email them because I mean I don't even know anything about them so why am I trying to like build that connection right so I think that like warming up your lead is really important so if there is a specific creator that you do want to connect with that you know you want to connect with start commenting on their posts start liking their posts repost their posts like just engage with them maybe reply to their stories and have that sort of like repertoire before you even go in and be like hey would love to connect like do you want to grab a coffee or do you want to hop on a zoom call just make sure that you are warming up your leads before you actually cold outreach someone so comment on their stuff repost their stuff like their stuff maybe respond to their story maybe hit them up on dms first and just like say maybe comment about a post that you really like like hey i like this because of or like oh my god this is great like fire whatever it yeah. is right before you actually go in for the coffee date or the zoom meet or whatever you're trying to achieve yeah and for everyone the goes and thinking of starting as a content creator whether it's TikTok, Instagram, or even YouTube, how should they approach starting out? Mainly on Instagram and TikTok. I'm talking about myself, for example. I don't have an Instagram mm -hmm. or TikTok and I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should have one. How should I yeah. go around it, for example? If you already are creating content, I would think about maybe creating the same topic of content on those other platforms just because it makes it a lot easier for you to build that overall brand structure for yourself if you don't have any other content so if you're not on any other platforms i would first think about what it is that you want to create content about like if you're aiming for content creation and not just creating a profile about yourself so think about what are some things that interest you a great saying that i heard from someone else was you should create the content that you love consuming so look at your algorithm and see like what is the content that engages me the most and that i love watching and hearing about and like learning about because that's a great place for you to start because typically you already have an interest in that topic you already probably know a decent bit because you have been consuming that content yeah so figuring out like what it is you want to say because i think that's the first that's often what causes that like fear in people is like from starting is not knowing what to post about. Um, so I think that's a really easy way to go about it. It's like, if I watch a lot of educational videos about productivity, that's what I can maybe talk about. If I read a lot of books, book talk is really popular now. So yeah. For example, I'm really enjoying these productivity type of videos that look a little bit like they're straight out of an iPhone type of UI UX. 
if you get what mm, I mean yeah. with the look. Yeah. But I'm also really enjoying the cinematic videos, like really slow paced that actually tell a story and then they have like sick views and sick cinematics. Yeah. So if someone that likes two or three different things, how do you go around that? You just choose one because you're going to really mix all of them. Yeah, totally. Honestly, my best advice is just to try it all first, because mm. at this point you don't have an audience. It doesn't matter. Like people aren't going to, you know, message you and be like, why did you change your content? Because your audience is quite small right now. Right. This is the perfect time for you to just experiment because like you said, those two specific styles, yes, they look very different, but they're also going to feel very different to create as well. And they're going to take different amounts of time and effort and like editing skill. So try it all. Like when you're starting, just try it all and see which one you like to do. Like maybe you like the cinematics, but you realize it takes you two months to create one video because you have to get all the b-roll and write the story and edit and add you know color grading and all of that and maybe you just don't want to spend that much time creating one video so yeah just experiment when you're first starting out and just see what lands with the audience but also what you enjoy creating yeah. how do you deal with for example someone that starts now and doesn't get the views that oh i spend way too much time and then you get 10 views but I can imagine mm. that nowadays you still have that, that you are posting a video and you spend so much time and energy and you think, oh, this video is really going to perform and then it doesn't. Mm -hmm. How do you go around that? Yeah, it happens all the time, honestly, even for me. You just have to keep going because I think what I've learned now and what's sort of ingrained in me is that it will just happen, right? Like the algorithm changes, people's interest changes. Sometimes your hook doesn't land. Whatever the reason may be, don't let that be a reason for you to stop because the only way that you're going to consistently get a lot of views on videos is if you keep improving and keep making videos and keep testing. So almost start to see your failures as a part of the experiment. So in tech, we have this word that everyone just lives by and it's the word iterate. It's like iterate, 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 fail forward, fail forward. That's what working in tech is all about. Um, you're gonna get a ton of failures. Things aren't gonna work, things are gonna break, but how can you learn from that experience to make the next one better and to make the next version better or improve your editing skill? So that's kind of how tech has sort of changed my mindset around creating and I think it's a great thing that I think like this because it makes dealing with failures a lot easier but yeah just kind of see it try it your best to see it as an experiment and like as the next step or like as one step towards your goal hmm. mm -hmm. that's I think a good way to see it you've been in tech for 10 how many years 10 years you said oh, th that's a content creator 10 years yeah, I've been in tech for just over seven years now. And why tech and not just decide for going for something more marketing related as an agency or totally. something like that? Yeah, I honestly didn't start out wanting to be in tech. Like I obviously studied marketing. I came out thinking maybe I want to be in an agency. So I think when you're coming out of marketing, you're deciding like, do I want to be client side or do I want to be agency side? And I actually started out client side, but I always thought that I would also try agency. I mean, I have agency experience, but definitely not as much as client side. But I essentially came out of school, started applying for jobs and, and companies that I was interested in. And there was this one startup in my city, which was the company that I ended up working for for seven years. But yeah, I applied for a job. I got it. I thought that it was going to be a stepping stone. I kept getting promoted. I kept like gaining these new projects and experiences to work on. And, you know, I blinked and seven years went by. <laughs> so it never was really a part of the plan to be in tech. That wasn't my goal, but I ended up there and I just loved everything about it. And yeah, seven years later, here I am. <laughs> and why not go full time on the content creation side, actually? Yeah, so I actually have recently sort of taken it full time. 
I say sort of because I am still doing consulting work. So I'm actually, I've shifted from being a full-time employee at my tech job to being a marketing advisor. So I am now on the team as a contractor advising the remaining marketing team in their strategy. Mm. And so technically I've quit my job and content creation or YouTube is my main source of income. But yeah, I haven't really, I've like kind of half left the tech world because I still definitely want to do consulting work and do freelancing work yeah. just because it's, it feels like something that I'm not a chapter that I'm not finished with yet. Um, but yeah, I have like, I would say shifted most of my focus towards building my business and being a YouTuber. <laughs> Congrats then. Thank you. How do you go now that you're working from home full-time yourself employee, let's say full-time your own mm. brand? How do you divide your day and decide, okay, now it's time to work. Now it's time to do this. You say you live yeah. by your calendar, but do you plan it the whole mm -hmm. week in advance or do you plan the day before? Yeah, I plan the week in advance. So really it hasn't felt like that big of a change because I did work remotely. Like I worked from home at my tech job as well. So I've essentially replaced my eight to four block for me, not nine to five, eight to four block with work for my YouTube business mm. or for content creation. But the difference really is now I have that added flexibility of, you know, shifting around like when I go to the park, just like dependent on the weather or like dependent on when my dog is really begging me to go. And I don't have to be locked to my desk and make sure that I'm clocking in at this time and clocking out at that time. I just break down what a normal work hour would be. So eight to four, I break it down into all the different tasks that I want to accomplish that day for my business. And then I then schedule in all of like, you know, the breaks, the walks, all of that, the meals. Um, and yeah, I always sort of plan my work week out the weekend before so like saturday and sunday i'll take i'll find some time to plan out the entire week ahead i decide this is how many pieces of content i want to film these are the time blocks that i'm going to have for filming these are the time blocks i'm going to have for writing this is the time blocks that i'm going to have for responding to emails and setting up brand deals so i'm very structured <laughs> with how i do my work but it just also helps to make sure that i get everything done and that i'm not overworking as well yeah were you overworking before that you were having your nine to five, eight to four, actually? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Not that I am working significantly less now, but I mean, that's how it goes, right? You're working eight to four, your full-time job. And then what time do you have left to create content and do anything on the side? It's your time after and your time before and your weekends. Yeah. So yeah, as I mentioned before, like, Thankfully, I really love doing this stuff. It makes me feel fulfilled. It energizes me. And I was so happy to spend those additional hours in my day doing that stuff. But now it does feel a little bit more relaxed because I can work on those throughout like the main portion of my day. And for anyone that would think like, oh, I'm worth still working full time. I want to be a full time creator or work for my mm -hmm. own. How would you recommend or how would you suggest that they go around it? Great question. I have actually had some friends ask me this. And I think, first of all, you need to figure out like why you want to do this thing. Because I think the biggest mistake that people make is that they, they think they want to start something and then they start it and then they lose steam and they lose motivation when it doesn't go mm. like they planned or whether it doesn't go as quickly as they planned. But I think the reason that you lose that intrinsic motivation is because you don't know why you're doing it. So even if your why is because it brings me joy, because I like creating content, because it's fun, like that's totally fine and a valid reason, but just like first dictate and like decide what that why is because I think that why is ultimately going to help you continue doing that thing yeah so yeah figure out like why you want to do this in what way does it fulfill you whether it's monetary whether it's enjoyment whether it's creativity and then decide how much time you want to spend on it initially so like I am by no means expecting anyone to just like suddenly be spending all of their evenings and every weekend do, to do this thing unless it's something that you really want to build in the business and you love doing it then like 
by all means, go ahead. It's great that you can do that. But I don't expect like the typical person who's just experimenting with it yep. to want to spend that much time doing it. So figure out how much time you want to do or how much time you want to spend in your week to dedicate to this thing and then just set a schedule like if it's every tuesday evening i'm gonna write youtube videos every wednesday evening i'm gonna film the youtube videos and then every thursday evening i'm gonna edit the videos great three evenings a week you're gonna do those things and then you're gonna repeat it the next week so just figure out that schedule because it's so easy to just like get overloaded and overwhelmed you know yeah i think having that structure really really helps and having that why and the monetary wise, because perhaps at the beginning you don't see any money, but then mm-hmm. yeah, how would you yeah, recommend that someone tackles it? Would you say that someone waits a few months until they get, I don't know, brand deals and they start seeing money from it? Or if they really believe in it, that they go like, okay, just give it a try for a certain month and then... Totally. So if you're defining money and like revenue as your why, you should ask yourself, how important it is like how much will this money affect you like do you want to earn money now or do you want to potentially earn money from this later because if you want to earn money now content creation probably isn't the best way to go about it freelancing is a great way you can start earning money now but if you also enjoy doing it and you you just want to build an audience and you want to build a community or you just want to build your presence on a platform and you want to earn money then yeah maybe it is like the right choice for you do you know what i mean so i think that's why that why is so important it's like if you're really in in need for cash right now and you want to improve your lifestyle or you know move to a bigger apartment or whatever the reason is i don't think content creation is it because it does take time it really does You could even maybe say, like, if you want to earn money now, start freelancing and create content for your freelancing business on the Mm -hmm. side. Because what that's going to do is it helps you build that audience, but it also helps you grow your freelancing business. So, yeah, earning money right now, do something else. (laughs) Do something else first until you feel secure enough that you want to spend time doing content creation. Makes sense. I think that it's interesting, the freelancing and the content creation, but... I do think content creation can provide you with a lot of income or opportunities and whether it's not money, it's also meeting people and having experiences. Totally. But the bills Mm -hmm. need to be paid anyway and experiences don't pay the bills. Totally. Yep. (laughs) Have you had that? Perhaps you said no or yes to a brand deal just because you needed to pay some bills or were you always really like, I do believe in this company, I do like what they do. Or mm-hmm. were you always like, oh, I find this fun, let's do it. It was never a, as yeah. a necessity. Because I've heard creators that they just took brand deals because they needed to pay the bills. And Yeah, I think luckily for me, because I had a full-time job that paid the bills, I never really had to do it out of necessity. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why it took me so long to get to that point where I wanted to do this full-time because I didn't want this to become like a necessity you know I didn't want to just take on brand deals just because I had to make a buck I definitely in the beginning like before I kind of figured out my own values as a person and the message that I'm trying to send and like the content and my niche and all of that before all of that I definitely just took on brand deals as they came because it was cool. Like I was like, oh, wow, this company wants to pay me money. Of course, I'm going to say yes. I definitely have taken on brand deals like very early on in that whole journey where now looking back, I'm like, why did I do that? Like that was so does not make like I don't know if you were around on Instagram or when this was like a phenomenon, but there was like this thing called like skinny mint tea or something. And it was essentially tea that would help cleanse your colon and in turn make you skinnier so like help you deep load okay and there was a lot of like female creators like promoting this tea and that we're working with this tea brand but the like experience of drinking that tea is quite awful like it's very (laughs) painful like just unpleasant experience but that was like one of the very early brands that were willing to pay yeah i would not wish that upon my worst enemies like do not drink this tea it's awful but yeah like those 
I can look back and laugh now, but thankfully I never really had to depend and like just work with all these companies that I really don't believe in. Mm -hmm. If you were uh, nowadays to define percentage of income, how would you divide mm -hmm. it into, I don't know, 50% brand deals, 30% affiliates and... Yeah, so just like on the content creation side? Yeah, whatever you prefer. So just on the content creation side, it's pretty much nearly 100% brand deals. Mm. So I don't really make much money on affiliates. It's not really a market that I've really like tapped into. Yeah. I would love to have that as a revenue stream, but I also don't want to like work so hard at selling just one brand because I know I can make affiliate dollar yeah. off of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, YouTube AdSense really doesn't make you that much money. I would say it's like in a month, it probably is like 10%, okay. 20% max, depending on like how many brand deals I have going on that month. Yeah. And that's like very recently when I started to experiment more with ads um, before it was like very minimal, <laughs> like very small amount of money coming from YouTube AdSense. Um, when I was still full time, it was pretty much like, 50% of my income would come from my nine to five job. And then 50% of the income would come from brand deals, essentially. But yeah, brand deals is still very much so like the majority revenue source in my content business. It's a big step, right? To go into the unknown of the content creation and decide, okay, now what was my 50%, I want it to be my 100%. So then you give up mm. all the nine to five job how do you go around that decision like do you think that the yeah. upside is bigger in content creation than on the nine to five side yeah it was a very tough decision to make because it's terrifying right you're letting go of stable income that pays the bills and betting on yourself essentially to be able to make a living and not only make a living but like also grow as a business what I told myself when I was making this decision is by doing content part time as I've been doing it for however many years, I have been able to get my revenue to match my tech salary. Hmm. So we were like play even playing grounds as much as I was making in tech, I was making through my business. So if I can focus on this full time like, where's the ceiling? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like if I just double the amount of time I put in this, where can I take this revenue? So I think that revenue match first was the first level of like security that I had. It was like, okay, at least now I know if I quit my job, I can pay the bills. Yeah. I can eat, I can live, I can still like enjoy my life for the most part. So then after that, it's like, do I have brands that I work with pretty consistently I started to it was like brands that I could work with year after year because we've had a good experience with each other so that was great so that kind of added like the next level of security and then after that it's just all mental it's like telling myself that okay I only put in this much time before if I put in more time I bet I could grow it even faster right so yeah it's it's such a mental game but I think if I had never matched that income, yeah. I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And the, your business of the deskware, is it mm. a desk utility? How do you say it? Like workspace Yeah, workspace goods. goods. Do you believe that thanks to you having a big of an audience and making a lot of content, it brings and turns into people, oh, this is cool, I want to buy it? Or is that not a really big part of it? It definitely does. I will say I do not talk about my brand enough. Like I should be talking about it so much more. And for some reason in my mind at some point in time, it just became two separate things. I do want to spend more time sort of leveraging my audience and just like introducing them to this brand because I do really believe in the products that we create, yeah. right? Like I love the brand that we've created. I would say initially when we first started the brand, it was very heavily dependent on my audience, but we were also able to like develop the brand's own audience and sort of find other sources of um, how to like gain customers, yeah. I guess. 
yeah so I, honestly right now it's not very dependent on my audience but I would like to change that and maybe just help boost that company a little bit more through my audience and you need to split the revenues let's say from that with your oh. other people so we actually do not take money out of that business so every dollar we make in that business gets reinvested mm. into that business so it's more a so fun project not, yeah it's a fun project i mean it would be great if i could get it to a place where we could pay each other out like a decent amount of money we've had had good months where we're able to like just pay each other out a little bit but very much so we're just trying to see where we can grow this business and to do that you have to reinvest money yeah. into it what's the margin actually on, on those type of products it's not amazing because at the end of the day like you have to you know work with the manufacturer you have to receive the shipment like shipping costs are so crazy expensive especially in canada specifically yeah. we just have an awful <laughs> an awful like shipment courier system here so yeah the margins like really aren't amazing they could be better and we're sort of working towards developing more product ideas that are less bulky and heavy and more like smaller <laughs> and easier to ship yeah it's not great it's profitable but it's not amazing like i wouldn't if you were trying to make money this is not the business i would recommend <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Fair enough. I have a question because before you mentioned you make like design content and daily mm -hmm. wearing, I don't remember the name, outfits type of yeah. fashion. That's the word I was looking for. You make fashion content on Instagram and TikTok, but then you make yeah. productivity related content on YouTube. How does those mm -hmm. two combine? They do not. <laughs> <laughs> so... It's really funny because I actually think I have three separate audiences that I serve between Instagram, between TikTok and between YouTube. And I didn't intend for it to be that way. It just sort of grew that way. And I think it came from me just never wanting to niche down because my belief, my internal belief is that how could you niche a human down to just one topic? Hmm. Like humans, like we all have so many interests and so many things we're great at and so many things we can educate people on. And so that's been my biggest challenge as a content creator is niching. Like if I could have niched down from the beginning, I think I could have grown a lot faster, but I just couldn't do that like I didn't want to. So right now on Instagram, it's very much so lifestyle fashion. On TikTok, it's very much so books, lifestyle, and a little bit of fashion. And then on YouTube, it's like something entirely different. So I'm trying to figure out a plan right now to amalgamate all of these things. <laughs> and so I think what I ultimately will have to do is like build the bigger brand that houses all of these things. Mm. So I don't think I'm going to like completely shift my Instagram and TikTok, I think like at the end of the day, those platforms show me like yeah. other aspects of me and who I am and what I do in a day. But I will sort of start connecting the dots a little bit better. Hmm. So it's like showing more of my work day in those lifestyle videos on TikTok and Instagram. And then maybe in my vlogs, I can talk, you know, just show more candidly like other aspects of my life outside of work. Yeah, connecting the dots. It's not going to be perfect. I don't want it to be all of the same content. But yeah, that's kind of like how that happened, I guess. <laughs> Why not try to make at least fashion productivity type of, I don't know, it's a little bit more like yeah. minimalism type of thing or like, you know, capsule outfits. That, that's a little bit more productive, if you could say it. You mean on, on YouTube? Yeah, or both. Like trying to relate the content of fashion and what you do or where, or I don't know how you make it because I don't have social media, Yeah. but more into the productivity, try to like mix and match both, you know? Yeah, um, I have been trying to do that a little bit on Instagram and TikTok. I think really how I'm planning to connect the dots is still coming back to that vision statement, right? That just cause it's like, what is the goal that I have the goal that I have is to help people 
live fulfilled lives and like connect their personal growth and career success so it's like how can i do that through fashion content or book content or lifestyle content or productivity content i think like that is the string that's going to tie everything together i have been trying to do more like these are the apps that i use to like plan my outfit and to mood board and sort of like connecting in in that way so yeah i think that's like a perfectly great like designing a capsule wardrobe and like planning that out and being systematic with it and how can i show that in content i think that's another great way to do it really i just want to make sure that all of the content still like hits that goal Mm. of like it helps people live fulfilled lives and like that's the direction i want to move to yeah and what's a fulfilled life for you yeah a fulfilled life for me is really just like feeling like you are waking up inspired and motivated and energized and that you are actually getting to work on things that make you feel like you've made a difference so it's like you're getting to work on projects that not only help others but also you know fuel your own creative battery you're getting to you know have really great moments with your friends or like your social network you're you're kind of living a very balanced life and you're not so leaning towards like one side or the other yeah you're not like stressed out all the time (laughs) yeah and how do you balance money into that equation of feeling fulfilled Mm, great question i think the secret for me is i mean for me personally how money fits in thankfully and very luckily is that the things that I love doing like these what used to be a passion project content creation has turned into something that that makes me money and now I think I'm on like the other side of the spectrum where I'm just trying to not let money ruin this thing that I love doing Mm. but yeah I think it's really just a matter of I think it depends right like if you if you work a nine to five and you're not planning to do something on your own and not planning to be an entrepreneur it's making sure that you are finding the time to do the things that make you feel fulfilled and then if you are an entrepreneur if you're like me and you're like a lot of other content creators where the thing that you love is now the thing that makes money it's making sure that you have the boundaries that keeps your life balanced you know like not letting money completely dictate how you do something or what you do or the content you put out and then also not just like not losing interest and like not losing that passion and love for the thing that you're doing that's does that make sense yeah those are great words i think there are in capsules what i also think and believe in is to be a fulfilled life feel that Mm -hmm. we should be happy with what we do and whether that's working a nine to five and doing that or whether that's becoming an entrepreneur and not doing that as well there's no right or wrong answer totally i do think Mm -hmm. that if you're i don't know a content creator and then you make videos that not even your family watches or play on the background and they really are bad maybe you should definitely Mm -hmm. reconsider that as a hobby instead of as a money machine if you could call it totally yeah And that's fine. Like, it's fine to make content as a hobby. I think because of how popular the creator economy is these days, everybody goes into it Mm. thinking, oh, it's going to make me money. I want to make money from this. But like, it's also just fun. Like, if you just want it to be a creative project and just as a creative outlet, do that and like not worry about, oh, is this going to affect brand deals? Is this going to whatever? Like, at the end of the day, it was designed to be like a social thing and a creative thing. Yeah. And so if you want to use it as that, like do it and just have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't totally. need to be a business. Totally. What's your creative process like actually? So you have your calendar and you say, I'm going to plan and record on these days and perhaps mm-hmm. write on these other days. But how do you actually come up with ideas? Where do you get your inspiration from? And when do you think mm-hmm. this is a video worth making or not? Also for YouTube and for Instagram, actually. I want to hear both. Mm, Yeah. So I would say where I get a lot of inspiration is from where I consume. So I read a lot of books. I follow a lot of like magazines. So I follow The Atlantic, The New York Times. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I consume a lot of TikTok and Instagram. 
but I always try to consume very intentionally now. So instead of doom scrolling and just like mm-hmm. getting addicted to that process, I go into every time I watch content and I shift my mindset into, okay, I'm enjoying, I'm going to like sit here and watch TikTok for 20 minutes, but like, what is something I can learn? Mm-hmm. So I try to pick out things that I can learn, whether that's a cool editing style or a topic or how to build like how to style jeans or whatever it is. I try to make sure that I'm coming away from that scrolling session with something new. So, yeah, I think I take a lot of inspiration from just like the places that I consume, because at the end of the day, in order for me to bring value in the content that create, I have to be able to educate or entertain in some way so it's like how am I going to do that I can't educate you on something I know nothing about and sometimes you know I don't go into building a video knowing everything that I am going to say in that video so I have an idea I'm like I read this book about burning out and there's so many great points I want to share in the book but like what else can I bring to this video so I'll do research I'll look up like studies and research groups that have been done about the topic of burning out I will look up maybe other like news articles or magazine articles or blog posts written about the topic and just try to compile all of the most interesting facts um, and build it that way. Something that I do that I started to do like a couple months ago that I think is so helpful is I actually have a Notion dashboard that I call the inbox and it's something that I like bookmark onto my phone, the inbox. And what it does is I click quick notes. I've like created a shortcut, click quick notes, and it just adds today's date and then it starts a list. And then I'll do this while I'm walking, while I'm driving, while I'm watching other content and I'll just hit the little voice button and just talk into the mic about what I'm learning from that thing. Hmm. So if I'm watching a video, it's like, oh, you know, this person said this, this and this, that's really cool. Or if I'm reading a book and be like, oh, this is a really good tip about burnout and I'll record that. And so I have this almost like database of ideas of just like random things that I've found interesting or related to or resonated with. And so I'll use that to sort of pull ideas from, yeah. especially for long form content. Like I need to sort of sit with the idea for a while and like maybe consume other content around that idea to really get to a place where I feel like I can bring value to that topic. Yeah. On Instagram, on TikTok, it's so on the fly. <laughs> like people ask me what my creative process is on those platforms and I'm like, it's just whatever I feel like that day. <laughs> so it's like I have formats, like I I have, you know, outfit check videos or I have work from home videos. And so I have these formats that I'll play within um, and I'll just think of like new ways to show those specific topics. TikTok is so casual. Like sometimes I'll just pick up the camera and like talk to it. Sometimes, you know, I'll finish reading a book and just put the camera on and be like, hey, I just finished reading this book. This is what I thought about it. Like Mm. it's just way more on the fly, on the go, like so much less planning goes into it. Yeah. So it's actually very different, I guess, the the creative process between long form and short form for me. YouTube is more elaborated, let's say, than you have Instagram where it's a little bit more like, oh, today I feel like doing this and then sharing it and... Perhaps it could become a long form idea if it hits. And then TikTok exactly. is really more like your conscience. Like, this is what I think of this book. Yeah. And then you just post it. Exactly. Yeah. So like YouTube is like the most work. Instagram is like still decent amount of work. And then TikTok is just like post whatever. Like just have fun. <laughs> I should probably think about it differently, but I don't. Like I just want to have fun on there. <laughs> Do you actually have brands that say like, oh, I want you to post on TikTok this or Instagram this or when they reach out for YouTube, for example, do they ask you to also Mm -hmm. post on other social medias? Yes. So it's very common for brands to ask me for Instagram and TikTok because there's more similarity there on YouTube. Sometimes they'll request that I also post on like they want to buy a sponsored post on Instagram and TikTok and I'll say no because it sometimes the brands just don't make sense. Like I could talk about a website designer on um, on YouTube, but it doesn't really make sense for my mm, audience yeah, and the other platforms. Sense. I do also, however, have two other pages. Feelgoodstudios.co, I changed the name recently, but I have it on Instagram and on TikTok. And those were really pages that I created to talk about similar topics to YouTube. Yeah. 
And so it makes more sense for brands to do like one YouTube integration or yeah, a TikTok on Feel Good Studios and then an Instagram on Feel Good Studios. But as far as like my Instagram and TikTok, like my personal ones, the connection isn't always there. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So I kind of like decide whether I take the added work based on that. How many hours a day do you use your phone? Oh, that is a great question. Let me expose myself and look at my settings. It Some days, way too much. Other days, not as much. Okay, so five hours is my daily average right now. Oh, wow. But it's because I've been consuming so much YouTube content on my phone mm. this week because I've been on the go. I've just been, yeah, kind of like been traveling around, going to cafes, like visiting friends and stuff. So I've just been watching videos like this <laughs> so much. And I think that is where a lot of that comes from. If I'm spending like most of my week at home where I'm on my computer all the time, then like barely any time at all on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. So still spending screen time. It just depends on what what device. <laughs> and how many hours do you, or what percentage also do you think that is actual consumption of content probably the majority of it mm. because like i use this to post to consume content to answer emails to write in my notion dashboard like yeah those are like the main purposes oh i edit with my phone sometimes edit so with your phone i kind of yeah so i edit a lot of short, short form on my phone okay yeah i won't do long form that's no. crazy yeah <laughs> so do you yeah. record also with your phone like short form short form yeah so you're basically always on the fly with that camera and then you record and then edit as well on your phone and then yeah. you just post them. Yes, for short form. Sometimes it's like I literally just record within TikTok even and just like to mm. cut out the editing process. Yeah. But yeah, most of my short form filmed, edited, posted on my phone. What's the favorite thing about what you do? The learning aspect. Like I love learning new things. And I feel like this is an industry where you are constantly learning. Mm. Like whether that is learning strategies about how to grow, whether that's learning editing, whether that's learning writing for captions or newsletters, whether that's learning like to find more topics yeah. about what you're going to talk about. So like I love to read. And so it works perfectly because I can read and like consume all this like great knowledge and then share it with people like that. It just feels like the perfect balance for me. Yeah. Yeah. So the learning aspect. It's funny that you mentioned it because the other day I had a conversation with this other creator. It's called Oliver mm -hmm. Wright. And he mentioned that also he enjoyed the most the learning progress of the content creation because every day he's trying to find something new. So he does like men's fashion. And he tries mm. to expose like grotesque things a little bit. Like, I don't know, he has dry fits. So he makes content around his dry fit and trying to solve it. Yeah. And he says that he's finding so much new things and articles and news. And every day he's learning something new. And that's also his challenge. And one of the reasons he's doing what he's doing, which is the learning. Totally. Yeah. I think like between content creation as a job versus working in marketing as a job or like working in tech you also have to learn so much and so often when you work in marketing and tech because those industries are always growing but like working for yourself like it's like you really are learning every single day yeah. and you're like challenging yourself every day and it never gets boring and so yeah that's definitely by far like the the thing that like keeps me going so you say you like reading a lot how many books a week or a month do you read do you have like a goal for the year? This year, I'm aiming to read 50 books. Oh. Um, I did 43 last year. Oh, wow. I am behind though. I started off the year really strong. But the last, I want to say since I went full time with the content creation, I've been like reading less or at least reading for enjoyment less. I still read nonfiction books a lot, mm. but I haven't been crushing fiction books as often. <laughs> I think I'll still meet my goal, but I'm just going to have to dedicate some more time. So that's like one book a week. <laughs> my goal was really five books a month. I started out strong, but like I only read one book in, I read two books in May and then like one book in June. So how do you do now. that? I'm, I'm really struggling to like read one book a month. And <laughs> how do you read one a week? Are you reading nonfiction books only? Mainly. Yeah, I think that's why, like, because... 
oftentimes like not only are nonfiction books more boring to read but oftentimes you're like learning as you're reading and sometimes it just takes you longer to digest that Mm. information like I will often read a portion of a nonfiction book and have all these ideas that I learned from the book. And I'm like, oh, I have to apply them and try them first. And then I put the book down for a bit. Yep. And so I, you know, try out all these new things that I learned, da, da, da. And then I'm like, okay, that was good. What else can I learn? So I think just like the reading process is quite different when you're reading nonfiction. When I'm reading fiction, however, it's like the equivalent of like wanting to binge a Netflix show. It's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Mm. It's that story, right? And so... I enjoy reading both. I do read both. And the fiction books, like I can probably, not probably, I can finish a fiction book in a day, but I couldn't like finish a nonfiction book in a day. Mm. Yeah. So I think like the fiction books really adds volume to like how many books I'm reading. I never really got to read fiction books. I don't know. I never really found them interesting. Just that. Yeah. Totally. There's, I mean, there's like so many genres. Yeah. Um, I think I just need to find the genre. Maybe just haven't found. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting, actually. The reading 50 books. I remember seeing this video from Ali Abdal where he mentioned that Mm -hmm. he read like 100 books in one year, I think it was, or something like that. One of the tips that he gave was if you read the book and at a certain point you feel like the author is repeating himself, especially with nonfiction books. Skip it just finish it because then you already got the lesson yeah. and then just moving mm-hmm. on and consider it as read because you're not yeah. going to get anything extra from that book and i realized that with this book called extreme ownership within the first mm, three yeah. chapters he made the point like yeah you need to own what you do and he made the point and then it was just stories of how in the war they were applying that concept and helping soldiers yeah. so after i think 60 pages the point was made for me and I took my lessons and just moved on do you do that as well of just moving on on the books or not really I've started to um I think because my love for reading grew from fiction I used to come into reading thinking I have to read the book cover to cover and even if I don't like the book I still have to finish it cover to cover Mm. like it was just ingrained in me but now I would say like in the last year or two I've really started to look at nonfiction books and fiction books very differently fiction books I probably will read the whole thing if I am really hating it I just dnf it like I don't finish yeah. it nonfiction books I go into that nonfiction book with intention and I know what I'm trying to learn from it right it's like the title probably tells you what you're going to learn from yeah. it and so I speed read it so Um, I don't know if you've heard of the technique where you just kind of use your peripherals to read. So you just skim the page. So I'll speed read it. And I'll also skip entire sections if I feel like they're dragging on for too long. Mm. So a lot of authors do that thing where they teach you a point and then they give you a lot of examples. And they teach you a point and they give you a lot. So sometimes I'll just like read one example and then I'll skip all the examples and move on to the next point. So I'm starting to be a lot more strategic with the way that I'm reading nonfiction. And like, yeah, there's going to be a lot of fluff in nonfiction. So if you feel like you don't need all those other examples to ingrain that thought in your mind, then skip it. Like, it doesn't matter. What are your favorite three books and why? Nonfiction or fiction? (laughs) Nonfiction, because I don't really like fiction. (laughs) Yeah, great. They're actually probably all self-help books because I am very much so of the belief that like, if you can get yourself to a place where you're good and you're stable and you're doing well then like every other aspect of your life can also grow yeah so daring greatly by Brene brown because it just teaches you about why vulnerability is actually such a strength in your life and that's i think that's just missing from the world like people often see vulnerability as like a weakness yeah but really vulnerability helps you connect deeper with humans helps you connect with yourself more helps you learn about yourself so that's definitely one permission to feel by dr mark brackett Another really great one, it just teaches you about emotional intelligence and how you can learn to like understand and regulate and utilize your emotions better. So I think that's just a skill that they 
don't ever teach us yep. and it's such an important life skill like I don't know why they don't teach us in school yeah so that one I think is just like an absolute must read for all humans and then how to do the work by Dr. Nicole LaPera it talks about trauma and like healing your inner child and like really understanding yourself in that way I think oftentimes we see this word trauma as like this big scary thing like oh I don't have trauma but I think everyone has trauma in some way whether it's familial whether it's societal you know wherever like we all go through really tough things in life and so that book really just teaches you to just be more self-aware and like look inside and and try to solve some of the things that might be stopping you from achieving like success in other areas of your life yeah yeah so i think like those three for me personally really set the foundation to like my personal growth and got me to a place where i feel so much better and i feel more motivated and i feel like i can give my 100 percent to my job or my work or my friends or whatever else I'm trying to grow. Do you think you can also learn lessons from fiction books? A hundred percent. Yeah. It's not just about the story then. It's also, oh, there's something to learn. Yeah, completely. I'm reading The Fury by Alex Michelades right now. And it's a fiction book about these, this movie star that gets murdered on her island. And it's like one of those like whodunit sort of novels. Hmm. But in this part, there's this one part where they literally talk about the topic of healing your inner child. And it's like the author writes or like the character says, when there's a cognitive rift between who you are and who you were, when you go through something traumatic, you leave that age of you bookmarked so that it kind of like it stays in your mind and you kind of like pause your aging from then. So you yourself will keep growing, but forever in your brain, there's going to be you from when you were 10, from when you went mm -hmm. through a really tough thing. And it causes this like disconnect between the two things. Yeah. And so I really wasn't expecting like this murder whodunit novel to make me think about that in that way. But it was also so profound and I was like wow I have to write this down <laughs> like, I have to think about this a little bit but yeah for sure a hundred percent like you can learn things from fiction books to end this episode of the podcast what's one piece of advice that they gave you that stuck with you and that you would like to share with the mm, audience great question I think the best piece of advice And it's going to sound really cheesy probably and like really generic, but it kind of comes from that idea of like you can't fill anyone else's cup unless your cup is full. Mm. And I think that applies to all other areas of your life. Like you cannot do a good job at your work if your cup isn't full, if you cannot, you know, help and love on your friends or your partner or your family if your cup is empty. So it's like that idea of making sure that you take care of yourself first making sure that you're getting enough rest and like you're healthy and you're not overwhelmed and like setting that foundation of learning how to take care of yourself and care for yourself is actually going to be the thing that makes you way more productive and successful in all the other areas of your life so by far the best piece of advice that I've gotten it's hard to like learn to care for yourself properly And it definitely made the biggest change when it comes to like how productive I can be in a day. Sick advice. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. Where can people find you? <laughs> you can find me on YouTube at Angel Zhang. You can find me on Instagram at Speak of the Angel. You can find me on TikTok at Angel Z Z H E N G. Depending on what kind of content you're interested in, I got something for you <laughs> <laughs> on one of those platforms. So yeah, you can check me out in all those places. Thank you so much for being on this episode. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun and like very inspiring. I can't wait to have more of these conversations with like other people as well. And then I can't wait to have you on my upcoming podcast oh. as well. I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to that invitation then. Yeah, for sure. <laughs>